Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Borough Plan Committee on Wednesday, 12th of July. Um, we are still suffering a few technical issues, so I'm afraid the meeting is being recorded, but won't be live streamed due to those technical issues. So it'll be available at a later date. Uh, we also had the benefit of Councillor Condacor recording us from the back as usual. Um, right, evacuation procedure. Um, I think everybody here, including the member of the public, Mr. Smith, have. I'm pretty sure you've heard the evacuation procedure previously, so I won't bother going through the whole thing tonight. Uh, needless to say, there is no fire drill, so if the alarm goes off, follow me over the road. Uh, apologies, we have one apology from Councillor Phillips. I believe otherwise we have everybody else here. Uh, minutes, to approve the minutes held on the 18th of January. Has anybody any issues with those minutes? No? See no dissent, so I'll sign those off. Uh, declarations of interest. Have any members got any interest that aren't included on the schedule? Councillor Baxter Payne. Thank you, Chair. I just need to declare that as of last night, my employer has changed. I'm now employed by Vinci Construction Major Projects UK Limited. Thank you. That's noted. I take it you're updating that on the system anyway. So. Uh, public consultation. We have one speaker tonight, Mr. Smith, on agenda item six, which I think is the only substantive item on, on the agenda. So straight on to business, uh, Borough Plan Review Update. We're fortunate to have most of the planning policy team here tonight, and I think they're going to share the presentation out between them, because it is such a, a big document. So. Over to you, Jackie, is it? Thank you, Councillor Smith, and good evening. The agenda and appendices provide a report to update members on the latest stage of the Borough Plan Review and the documents that have been drafted to date, as well as update members on the latest position of the Gypsy and Traveller Site Allocations Development Plan document, the DPD. The Council consulted on the preferred options version of the Borough Plan Review in June-July last year, which was a non-statutory consultation stage. Comments received during this consultation, along with ongoing discussions with statutory consultees and the emerging evidence base, has formed the draft publication version of the Borough Plan DPD. A copy of the draft plan, which will guide development for the plan period up to 2039, is provided at Appendix A. Jade will now briefly outline the main reason for reviewing the Borough Plan and how the plan has evolved since the preferred options document. The Council committed to undertaking an immediate review of the adopted Borough Plan following the publication of the updated National Planning Policy Framework in 2020 and Practice Guidance in 2021. Whilst much of the draft publication plan's content is similar to that, which you previously saw at the preferred option stage, one of the key differences between the documents is that the plan period is being adjusted from 2024 to 2021. This is to align the date the review commenced and the plan period modelled within the HEDNA. Other changes include strengthening the wording of some of the strategic policies to emphasise the emphasised the need for future development to be more sustainable, contribute to the national need to achieve net zero carbon emissions, and for development to be adaptable and resilient to climate change. As well as this, amendments have been made to the natural environment and built environment sections, with design, climate change and biodiversity becoming more prominent factors throughout the draft publication version of the Borough Plan Review. In relation to housing provision, this is reduced from 646 dwellings per annum to 545 dwellings per annum. However, given the plan period has increased, the total quantum of development for the Borough Plan Review is broadly similar to that consulted on at the preferred option stage, 9,810 dwellings as opposed to 9,690. 
In terms of employment, the quantity of employment land for local industrial and distribution warehousing development is now defined as 68.45 hectares alongside 19.4 hectares of employment land for strategic B8 warehousing and distribution development. Sarah will discuss housing and employment in more detail next and further information on the differences between the preferred options document and the draft publication plan can be found at Appendix B. There we go. Sorry. Thanks, Jade. Um, as Jade stated, the figures for housing and employment provision consulted on for the preferred options document were informed by the draft header prepared by ICENI. You may recall that the Council, along with other authorities in Coventry and Warwickshire, commissioned ICENI to prepare a sub-regional header which took into account the 2021 census data and utilised 10-year mitigation trends. The sub-regional Hedner concluded a housing need figure of 409 dwellings per annum and an employment need of 47.7 hectares, which is significantly lower than the figures in the draft Hedner, which form the basis of the quantum, develop quantum of development consulted on during the preferred options stage. It was considered that given the aspirations for the borough, including economic growth and the extraordinary need for affordable housing, a bespoke report should be prepared to reflect the borough's unique position. The report considers the objectively assessed housing needs set out within both headners, as well as other considerations which may influence the council's decision on an appropriate housing and employment requirement, and concluded a figure of 545 dwellings per annum and an employment provision of 80.5 hectares. These are the figures which are set out within the draft publication version of the Borough Plan Review. Therefore, in terms of allocations, the strategic sites allocated in the draft publication plan for housing remain the same. However, a small number of non-strategic sites have been deallocated where there were some concerns over the deliverability of the sites. In relation to employment land, sites which are now under construction, including Faultlands Farm and Longford Road, have been removed as allocations as they are being delivered and form part of the committed employment land supply. As part of the plan process, the Council has a legal requirement to fulfil its duty to cooperate. Council officers have been working closely with officers from neighbouring authorities to draft a memorandum of understanding which sets out the current housing and employment requirement for each authority as established in the Hedner. Whilst this document is still in its infancy, it is intended to act as a starting point for any further discussions with authorities which may be required prior to the submission of the Borough Plan Review to the Secretary of State. The Council is engaging with the Planning and Advisory Service, who are acting as a critical friend to review our approach towards the duty to cooperate, as well as our policies, and early, indication, early indications show that we have a good basis for demonstrating that the duty to cooperate can be discharged. The Borough Plan Review is supported by an extensive evidence base, which is listed in Appendix C. You will note that whilst there are a number of supporting appendices, there are still evidence-based documents which are being finalised. I'll now talk you through the appendices which are in front of you. The draft borough plan map is shown at Appendix D. However, it's worth noting that this may change as evidence-based documents are finalised and ongoing discussions on sites are incorporated into the final plan. Appendices E, F and Q relate to the sustainability appraisal and habitat regulations assessment, which are required to be carried out at every stage of the plan making process. The SA underpins the plan by promoting sustainable development and helps to demonstrate its test of soundness, and the HRA assesses the potential impacts of the plan on a specific network of nature conservation sites and looks at any necessary mitigation. The revised Statement of Community Involvement is provided at Appendix G. This sets out how we consult on planning policy documents and on planning applications. The Statement of Community Involvement was last updated in 2020 to include the coronavirus restrictions, but a full comprehensive review has not been carried out since 2010. Therefore, to ensure all legislative requirements are being met, the Statement of Community Involvement had to be reviewed. It's now easier to read and additional detail has been provided in relation to consultations affecting listed buildings and their settings. The SCI is required to be signed off by both Cabinet and full Council. The Local Development Scheme is provided at Appendix H. 
This has two main functions, to identify the current planning policy documents that are being applied in Nuneaton and Bedworth, and to provide a three-year project plan that outlines what replacement planning policy documents will be and their stages of preparation. The adopted local development scheme went to Cabinet in June and full council the beginning of July, and it sets out that the publication document is scheduled for consultation in, in September, with its submission to the Planning Inspectorate by the end of this year. In conclusion, in relation to the Borough Plan Review, a number of the evidence-based reports are still to be received. Until these are finalised, there could be some... Thank you, Sarah. The Gypsy and Traveller Site Allocations Development Plan document underwent a hearing by PINS on the 27th of October 2023, sorry, 2022. Amendments have been discussed with the inspector, which has resulted in proposed amendments to the DPD. These have initially been agreed with the inspector, but we are awaiting on the final agreement. The ongoing assessment and the requirement for public consultation has meant that the local development scheme for the Gypsy and Traveller DPD has also been amended. Appendix I provides the latest draft Gypsy and Traveller site allocations development plan document to include the amendments requested by the inspector. Appendix J provides details of the main modifications and Appendix K has the additional modifications the main modifications are those recommended by the inspector to make the DPD sound and legally compliant. The additional modifications are those which do not materially affect the policies in the DPD, which are generally minor factual updates, corrections of any errors, or which are considered necessary for clarity. The main modifications need to be consult consulted upon and the comments forwarded to the inspector so that he can make his final determination. The main modifications also meant that the sustainability appraisal and habitat regulations assessment had to be reassessed, screened to ensure that these were not impacted upon by the amendments. Appendix L and O provide the screening and resultant uh, addendum required to the sustainability appraisal. The actual original sustainability appraisal is shown in Appendix M, whereas Appendix L shows the screening of the SA for the main modifications. This has subsequently meant that whilst the habitat regulations assessment has not required changes, which is Appendix N, the, the sustainability appraisal, Appendix M to follow, oh, sorry, you've got that now, required an addendum, which is Appendix O. These will now be considered by the planning inspector. The main modifications were screened to determine if further sustainability appraisal work was required and found that the modifications would not likely have a significant effect on the findings of the previous SA. For some doc topics, the modifications lead to improved outcomes um, and the modifications themselves were considered to constitute mitigation enhancement and it concluded that no further measures or mitigation were, uh, were considered necessary. The original Habitat Regulations Assessment, Appendix N, was reassessed for the main mods. Appendix B has been provided as an addendum and screening of those modifications and concluded that there would be no likely significant effects on habitat sites. 
Members are therefore requested to note the document and recommend the documents can go to Cabinet to agree to the main modifications of the Gypsy and Traveller Site Allocations DPD and amended uh, sustainability appraisal to continue to public consultation on these amendments. The request is with a caveat that any further amendment, amendments required by the inspector can be carried out under delegated powers of the assistant director in consultation with the portfolio holder for planning in the event the planning inspector requires these. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And breathe. You can all relax for a moment now. <laughs> a long presentation, but a huge document to get through. Uh, public speaking, then. We have one public speaker, Mr. Smith. You know the rules. You have three minutes. The, the subject we're discussing is the Borough Plan Review. If you can stick to that, please. Um. It's hard to know where this plan came from. It's just a copy and paste of uh, your statutory uh, obligations to government policy. Uh, the figures bet have not been drawn up for this area. We have higher death rates at the moment, a life expectancy falling, lower birth rates. So why the extra house building? It's obviously not for the residents of this area. The infrastructure is broken. Seven Trent are dumping crap into the rivers already. There's none of that have been addressed. The whole road system's broken. It doesn't work. It's full of potholes. Yeah, the transforming project is all but destroyed in Eaton Town Centre with the prospect of more. £150 million, the leader of this council said he had, but £20 million was put on the debt of this council that residents have to service to do the hotel. Where did the £150 million go? None of it's been spent in this area. Our roads are broken. The NHS is broken. Our schools are failing. Yeah? There's absolutely no reason for these crazy house building projects that you have. Yeah? You can't even tell us how much debt you're in. Yeah? What that's costing us or what you intend to borrow. Yeah? In the current climate, everybody in this borough has had to do that. This council cannot give us those figures. Hasn't even tried to, refuses to. I think that's, you should come clean, because all of this is just, I think we need to do drug tests in here, yeah? Because that is ridiculous bit of paperwork, yeah? Shocking. You don't bear any relation to this borough, or the people in it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So we have the recommendations. Um, can I have a proposer so we can debate? Councillor Walsh and a seconder. Councillor Kenner. Uh, any member? Councillor Cundercourt. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I take hours over saying all the things I want to say. So I think I'll save most of it for the inspection. Um, but I wanted to make a few general points about it because we, we've produced a borough plan that is very similar to the old one. Um, we've made a few improvements, and some of those improvements are most welcome, particularly, you yeah, mentioned things like ransom strips and things that have been a problem in the past. Um, but we've only gone 10% or 5% of the way we need to go to make a sustainable plan. And one of the things that really disturbs me is the housing target. Because when we try and ask for better housing, solar panels, cycle routes, all the things we want, we're told it's not viable because the, the margins are so small. And the reason the margins are so small is that house prices here are might be £100,000 less than there are in Warwick or Kenworth, maybe £200,000 less than Stratford-upon-Avon. And so when we're looking at what we can do and what we can ask for from developers is actually not a lot because of the viability in terms of infrastructure. So if you were doing a, a sub-regional plan and you wanted the homes to have solar panels, you want them to have cycle routes and GP surgeries and all the things that people want from development, you would build those houses where the house prices are highest and you can get the most infrastructure added to make them more sustainable. 
clearly that is effectively happening. If you look in the document at the amount of development going on in Warwick and Stratford-upon-Avon, it's amazing. Yeah, it, we're getting build rates that are really high because that is where there was a serious problem with the amount of housing. In Nuneaton and Bedworth, we actually have a problem of people not being able to afford the houses even at the lower costs. We actually have an economic problem, which is really stark between North Warwickshire and South Warwickshire. And we have a transport problem. So when we're talking about sustainability, one of the absolute key things would be to get better transport. Because if you wanted this plan to be passed saying, we've got better transport, we are going to have a train every 15 minutes from Nuneaton going through Bedworth to Coventry and down to Leamington and Warwick, uh, then yes, you can chuck loads of houses here and the people who lived here could get well-paid jobs, go to university, etc. But the plan acknowledges we only have one train an hour to Coventry. And if that's a situation, we need to plan for actually lower growth. If you... Um, Mr Smith sometimes is um, one of these sort of guns that shoots out all over the place. But actually, a lot of what is said actually has a lot of basis. And we are a very, very low growth area. Our births is now about 200 more than our deaths each year. And if you look forward a couple of um, years, our births will be almost equal to our death rate. That means we need no net extra housing. But what we do need is we need housing replaced. You know, some of our places will need better housing. Um, and we will need changes of the type of housing because we will need more extra care. So it's not like even with no population change, we don't need any housing. But it's astronomically silly, uh, and you see it on page 35 where it says unrealistic alternatives, and it calls the 425 homes per year um, low growth. Over the last 11 years that we had the data for, we built 460 homes per year. And at times, that was quite high growth. If you look at what happened in Wellington, St Nicholas, uh, you looked at the school problems, etc. Yeah, 460 homes a year is seriously high growth for a town with um, such low um, inward you know, reasons to move here. And effectively, what we're doing is we're, we're sort of like undercutting. We're trying to be the Ryanair of housing for Coventry and Warwickshire and that bit of Leicestershire. Um, but effectively, the fundamental targets are we need about 100 homes for our, our births minus deaths. We need some homes because people um, need better places to live. You know, we're not going to build 100 homes. That would be a stupidly low target. And if you look at the basic stuff, we should be looking at a 300-ish target. We have the evidence, because the government then adds 30% for affordability, of 400. So how on earth we got to 550? We just keep adding more and adding more and adding more. And it will not make a sustainable... Yeah. Um, in terms of particulars, I would have liked... A better plan and I think this plan needs taking down and starting again which is why at budget level I suggested don't do this plan this year do it next year I wasn't suggesting we don't need to spend a vast num amount of money on producing a plan I was saying we need to produce a really good plan and to do that we need to do it next year when we've got better policies hopefully a different administration uh, and actually people who understand sustainability because you can't just have a third-rate plan or 2-2 two -two plan and stick the word sustainability there on it. If you look at the applications we had last week and the example in Bulkington, or it might be the week before, we have a sewage works that is not coping. Already, this last year, it dumped into Wenbrook 30 times in a year for a total of 200 hours. Now, clearly, the planning system says we're not allowed to fix that with new plans you know, that's already an existing problem but it's evident that any additional house is an additional bit of sewage in that pumping station so th this if you read through the document it seems to imply our sewage network is fine it clearly is not fine and seven trent have totally failed to provide the infrastructure uh, i was talking to the chair earlier and we got this nice red green amber 
spreadsheet from Seven Trent. We're not using that. There is actually spare sewage capacity in the Marsden Lane sewage works. There's not in Bulkington on the west. There's not in Weddington. But we're not using the data we've got to work out either where we can build without adding capacity or where we actually need to add capacity in. The, 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 we are also having a massive sewer built from Hinkley all the way over to the Hartsell pumping station across the top of Weddington. That is totally missing from our plans and we have no requirement for Top Farm, which is right next to that sewer, to go into the new sewer rather than dump into my river anchor in my patch. Yeah, there's a, so much work we need to do to make this plan sustainable. Transport, we have Bulkington, which is very isolated. It's like on B roads that have high speed limits and we need to bridge those little gaps. Some of them are only yeah, just over a kilometre from the West Coast Main Line to the Canal Bridge in Bedworth. But yeah, we're not forcing those things to be built before we build the developments. So I very much think we should not um, go out to consultation on this plan. We should actually do the work to get all the problems sorted. And I think in terms of housing targets, we should have two targets. A target of what we do for our own needs, and then a target for what we can do to expand with a shopping list of what we would need to do that. Because if we want to take more people from the south, or employment from the south, we need the better train services. If we're doing things up at Dodwells and having housing for the south, west, north, whatever, Leicestershire, yeah, Dodwells need sorting out. There's lots of things that we should be asking for and actually having as a red line. We will not build more than 300 a year unless you give us X, Y, and Z. Yeah, we need those X, Y, and Zs. Yeah. And we're just not getting it. When they built the housing in Wellington, we had promises of cycle lanes, promises of GPs, promises of all sorts of things. We eventually got the primary school three years late. Um, and that's the only thing that's been delivered. So I, I could talk for hours, so I, I probably shouldn't, but there is just so much we need to do and get right. And this is not much better plan than the old one. The housing target is too old. There's no solar. It's crazy that we're building without solar on our roofs. It comes back to this viability, I'm sure. But fundamentally, it is a no-brainer that we should have solar panels on the roofs of our businesses and our new housing. And we go on to this, oh, we'll use these BREAM standards. Uh, and I think we see some planning applications sometimes that say BREAM good or BREAM very good. The one for the cinema scores 1 out of 13 on the BREAM score for energy. Although we've got this supposedly very good, it's very good because it's on contaminated land. It's very good because it's got this management plan or something, but it's absolutely appalling on energy. And so I think we need, if we are going to go with BREAM ratings, to actually say we need to ensure there's an energy standard in that and you can't just score all your defit points on other items. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Condicor. My word, what a lot. The world according to the Greens. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I know we'll argue about this all day, but I tend to rely on the experts to talk about housing numbers. I tend to rely on people like Seven Trent to sort out our sewers. I tend to rely on Warwick County Council to deliver cycle lanes that nobody's hardly going to use. And GP surgeries, clinical commissioning group. We don't build any of those. We embrace them in the plan, but delivery of them is not our responsibility. So. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take no lessons from you on that score, and we will rely on the experts to advise us on housing numbers. Uh, Councillor Kenner. Oh, now I am, thank you. Um, before I start, I just wanted to thank the, like yourself as portfolio holder and the entire planning team for this absolutely remarkable piece of work that you've pulled out at lightning speed in such quality and such detail. Uh, I think it's absolutely amazing to, to see. 
Uh, I'm pleased to see the non-strategic allocation at Tomkinson Road Rec coming out. I think if I've read the documents right, I remember I, I had some concerns about that um, this time last year or so. And if, again, if I'm right, the annual house building rate has come down by about half from the original plan, if, if that's correct. So, and also, it seems that the team and yourself, uh, Mr Chairman, have listened to residents as well by really cutting the number of gypsy and traveller sites from, what was it, 16, 17, so about four now. I think that's in incredible work. Just to come back on some of the points we have been raised, um, uh, Councillor Conticle mentioned cycle routes. He mentioned that people want them. I think by people he means him, because no one ever uses the one uh, on Wenton Road that, when I'm up that way. Um, and he also mentioned that a lot of what Mr Smith says is right. I just wonder which bit. Is it the bit about accusing staff of drug use, or is it that we're all masons giving each other legs up, or is it that we're Satanists or we irradiate babies? And on the point about Dodwells, again, uh, as the point you mentioned, uh, Chairman, about responsibility, uh, in, Councillor Condicott would know that that's National Highways, formerly Highways England, that do that. And uh, the last price tag was half a billion pounds. So if he can come up with that money, he can, he can, come up for, he can get in touch with National Highways, because I'm sure they'd be very, very pleased to hear that. And to call the, sta or the borough the Ryanair of housing, I think, is so deeply offensive and does such a disservice to the staff of this borough, I would hope that he would apologise to them for, for such an offensive remark. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, some good points there, well made. Um, Councillor Walsh. We're on, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Just a few little details myself. Obviously, it's a phenomenal piece of piece of work that's been done by your your team and the, the planning department. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, there's no way that I think anybody's going to be able to read it end to end. Uh, but uh, obviously, you've done one amazing piece of work. Um, just a couple of things I wanted to clarify for my own purpose. Um, a bit of confusion. In the housing section on page... 102 and 103 of the full document, or 95, 96 of the actual plan. We talk about, obviously, the spread of housing size, i.e. one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedrooms, etc. percentages, as has been set out by Hedna. Now, do we dictate to uh, the house builders the percentage of houses they build that... Uh, follow that line or is it something that is a guidelines as such yeah if i can just come back on that um that's our desired mix and our indicative mix so that is what we push for um when we negotiate with developers but it's not a stipulated mix so it, it is what we look for but it's not policy per se it's it's the desired mix so as close to that as we can possibly get is what we, we strive for Okay, so that's fine. Obviously, from a developer's point of view, in terms of a business, you know, to build obviously a three or a four bedroom house, potentially there's more profit in it, even if you base financial profit as opposed to percentage profit. Because obviously, if they are looking to achieve, we'll say a 10% profit, well obviously when you're building a 200,000 pound house as opposed to a 500 pound thousand house, your 10% is a lot different, isn't it? So from our developers, it would be more beneficial to build larger houses but obviously only in the place where there is a, a need for them because they could all build five-bedroom five, five houses at six, seven hundred thousand, but never sell them. So they need to obviously look at that to see what, the, what it says locally, what we need locally, don't they, to, to blend, shall we say. Um, the other one of the other questions I'm a bit concerned about, it's, I don't know if it's my maths or what, <laughs> but it's a bit confusing to me. If we turn to page 99 of the actual report, which is 106 of the agenda, we talk about affordable housing. So this is where I get a bit confused. So you might be able to help me on this one. Oh, I'm just seeing a bit of a smile there. Okay, let me get this right. It says 
national, sorry, we, we as a council are seeking a 25% of all new housing built being affordable. Okay? Of which the national standard requires 10% to be affordable owned houses, in other words, purchased houses. So then we say that of that 10%, sorry, yeah, of those nationally, there has to be 25% of them of being first time houses. So I'm getting a bit confused here as regards the numbers. So if a developer builds 100 houses, for example, as an easy number, we require them to build 25% of those being affordable. Of those 25 houses that are affordable, it's now saying 25% of those affordable houses should be for first time buyers. Am I, am I getting this right? Because it's starting to get a bit confusing to me. <laughs> Believe. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Um, the way I read it was it's supposed to be 25% affordable, so 100 houses, 25 affordable, of which 10 of those should be affordable to buy, of which a quarter of those should be reserved for first time buyers. That was my read and understanding, and that's from previous discussions as well. Um, the comment there is also we seem to be significantly under delivering on the affordable to buy. Mm. What we've delivered so far has been affordable to rent mm. uh, almost entirely, 99.1% of it. Uh, and so we need to understand what the mechanism is, maybe not in this meeting, but from planners uh, going forward on how we are going to ensure that we redress that so that over the plan we really have delivered that affordable to buy because we know that the public say the aspiration is still the vast majority of people to get on the housing ladder and what we're doing is denying them that opportunity we're not even meeting the minimum national standard there by saying that that you know 10 of those 100 new houses should be for, for uh, affordable to purchase and when we speak to residents whatever their voting intentions they all say there should be affordable houses to get on the ladder far more than they say there should be affordable houses to rent thanks uh, Jackie can you sort of uh, come back on that and give some clarity of where we are I'll certainly try to if I can Sarah yeah, please do. prompt me yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of the 10 percent of uh, houses requiring to be the new first homes, which is a government-led scheme, that's 10% of the whole site. That's what it's referring to. So we have to, yeah, so when we, when we make our 25%, we might have to round it up for first homes, which goes off then our, our own affordables, if you like. It's government policy, we've got to do that. Does that, does that help clarify that? But in terms of the, then it's the 25% of our 25% yes. affordables are so like, That's why I said the 25 like, to yeah, to yeah. Does does that help? And then, as I say, we, um, our if you speak to our housing team, they will actually say the the need in the borough is absolutely huge for social rented housing. So it, it's, it's the rented housing that we're then trying to make sure that we deliver because a lot of the market houses will be under the, the first home scheme, which is the government-led scheme. Councillor Truman, Chair. Thank you, Chair. If I could just come back in on the, the need. Um, it's one of those things where if you build, if we just built all of the ha new houses in the plan as uh, a as affordable social rent, you would fill them because the social landlords, the, the housing associations, will just pull in people from wherever. So at, at the end of the day, the need, actually, we've already provided a very significant amount. And as a matter of policy, you know, everybody would love to live in a subsidised house. But the idea is that we provide these for people that need them rather than want them so the want is definitely there and you know lots of people would like to live in a subsidized house which is effectively what it is but that's something that councils have traditionally provided to support people that need that support it's you know 
we don't have legislation that says a council house is a right. Um, we say we have legislation that says that people have you know, rights to be homed and to make sure that local authorities do that, but it shouldn't be, you know, we're not here to facilitate lifestyle choices. If people can afford to buy a home or rent privately or whatever, then that would be the norm and social housing that is purely social rent is, you know, it's not something that we should make up an obligation that doesn't exist on. It's not our government's policy or previous governments or even the borough's policy to do that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, affordable housing is a bit of a conundrum. In fact, it's a bit of a crisis for us, and I think Councillor Condico is one, one point we can agree on. Our land prices and, and the quality of what they can build here um, often runs into trouble with affording, affordable, with viability. Um, in the plan of the 545 houses, 407 of them have to be affordable. Now, that's a circle we can't join, you know, it, it's just impossible. Um, there are funds available, we're exploring other opportunities with West Midlands Combined Authority, for instance, to, to make some of those unviable areas come forward and maybe deliver a slightly higher level of affordable, but it is a conundrum, I don't know how we get over it, but... Uh, it is what it is. Councillor Baxter Payne. Thank you, Chair. I just was going to echo some of the comments I've heard earlier because when you look at the thickness of these documents that we've got before us tonight and the time scale that it's taken to get to this stage, I think it's commendable to the team the amount of work that's gone into it because I'm sure there's hours of work gone into every single page of this document. And to get to a position where we are in, in the time scale that we've got to, I think it's something that we, sh we should be happy that we've achieved. Also, I've said this before, I would rather take a document that takes slightly longer to produce, but be a hell of a lot more sustainable and less challengeable in a court when somebody takes forward an appeal against something than to rush a document and to be in a position where we have no, nothing to challenge and nothing to stand on. And just to pick up on one of Councillor Condacore's points. I've sat here many times in this chamber and I've heard you arguing about the delay to the borough plan. So how does your argument for a delay to the borough plan stack up with your comment tonight about we should tear that document up and all the officers work and wait until we ch uh, next year and start it all over again? Because surely that will delay the borough plan by even longer which means the current housing targets that are in the borough and the current sites that sit in the existing borough plan can be brought forward for development. So I'm confused as to the argument as to where tearing that up and starting again even starts. And your other comments about building houses in the borough that shouldn't attract people to come into the borough, if I didn't buy a house in this borough, I wouldn't be sat in this chamber tonight because I lived just down the road. I've chosen to come and live in Nuneaton and Bedworth. And I think there's nothing wrong with encouraging people to come and live in Nuneaton. There's nothing wrong with asking people to come and live in our town, visit our town, enjoy our town. So suggesting that we shouldn't build houses for people like myself, I do find slightly weird because like I say, I chose to come here. I've chose to live here. I've chose to make this my home. So there must be other people in the same situation as myself who actually want to come and live here. And so to say that we should build houses in different places and we shouldn't encourage people to come in or we should only build a certain number of houses for people to come from outside the borough, I'll never agree with you on that one. Thank you. I have Councillor Condacore to come back in then Councillor Walsh. Yeah, I've got a few points. Um, firstly, if we wanted no one to come into this borough, we'd build 100 houses a year. I clearly think we should be building the 300 or whatever. Um, so it's not, an, not encouraging people to come in. It's the scale of people going to different places. And as Stratford and Warwick start their large building schemes, and as the house prices go up and down, we shouldn't assume that we're going to be drawing in 1,000 people every year. If you want to fill 400 extra houses, you need 1,000 people. Uh, if you say we're going to have 
inward migration of 500 people a year, you need to build the sort of three, 350 houses. So it is all about the scale of development. And we, we talked about affordable housing. I think we should build 25% to rent and then build plenty that are 30, 70 shared ownership and get people able to buy houses. Because a key problem we have, and you look on the waiting list and you look at people renting, a lot of them do want to buy, but they cannot do the starting with 100% mortgage. Um, but we have got that massive, you know, we, we, we can't eat into the 25% that's affordable to rent to do that because we've got the ginormous waiting list. What we need to do is, is eat into the market housing, that 75%, and say those prices need to be more reasonable uh, for some first-time buyers. Otherwise, we're just solving one problem and, and hassling an, and breaking another problem. Uh, we was talked about Dodwells earlier. That was going to cost £20 million to do. It got faffed around for a decade and probably will cost 40 or £50 million. It is not a £500 million project. The half a billion pound price tags is the grand schemes to go from the M69 out to Aberston or something. They're, they're the big billion pound schemes. The Dodwell scheme is 700 metres. And you can't tell me, even if we got the contractors who did Bermuda Bridge, that 700 metres of countryside is going to cost half a billion pounds. Even Warwickshire is not that incompetent. Um, one other thing I forgot to mention last time, um, on the recommendations, I mean, it's got a page where it talks about air quality, and it mentions in 2020, 2021 and 2022, uh, the air quality was compliant. There was actually a pandemic. Um, and in 2022, the figures for Midland Road, which is where we've got a serious problem, the raw figures are 40.1. Uh, and when you bring in the calibration factors, it comes down to the high 30s. But we still have a very serious air quality problem on Abbey Green. And the World Health Authorities and the, everyone says our limits need to be a lot lower than that 40 anyway. So I don't want us doing nothing on air quality because probably 20 or 30 or 50 people a year are dying early in this borough because of air quality in places like Abbey Green, the busy roads going into Bedworth. We've got a real problem. And the, the, the issue is the government set the limits too high on really out-of-date data. We have an air quality problem that is shortening our lives. And Mr Smith, the bit I was agreeing with him on was actually we've got a very high death rate, low life expectancy in the borough. And that is not helped by the air quality, that's not helped by the obesity and the lack of uh, exercise and the lack of cycle lanes. And people would cycle and do cycle, but the numbers are dreadful because when you cycle down the Wenton Road, you get to the Leicester Road Bridge and Old Eaton Gyratory. Um, if people are moaning about people not cycling, try it and then you realise a bit of infrastructure would do marvels. And one of the things we kept getting promised was an entrance on the Wellington side of the railway station. So people in Wellington and St Nick's could cycle into the railway station on those little shared use or whatever and go straight on the train without cycling over the Leicester Road Bridge and round Empire Gym. So yeah. it's those things that we need in the borough plan to actually get a healthy environment. Uh, point of order, Chair. Um, we need to talk about the borough plan. We've heard there's been no timer on the speaker at any, at any of the occasions, um, and we need to talk about the borough plan, because here's the thing, I want world peace, but that's not what the borough plan can deliver. I'd like step-free access to train stations, but that's not what the borough plan can deliver. I'd like additional trains, but that's not what borough plans deliver, and doctors and whatever. But none of that is in the remit of a local planning authority. We cannot make those things happen. We don't have the budget or the legal powers for that. The councillor knows it. The councillor can call Warwickshire County Council Highways incompetent if he likes. But here's the thing. They're nothing whatsoever to do with the A5. That's Highways England. So, you know, the councillor knows all these things or has been oblivious for all the years he's been a councillor. So it's either misleading or it's just clueless. Either way, it's nothing to do with the borough plan. Can we talk about the borough plan, please? Thank you. Um, I have to agree with the point you made. We're not responsible for everything. And by the way, on that exit, uh, that other entrance into the train station, 
I believe that's in the plans for regeneration of that area. There will actually be an access on that side. Thank you, Chair. As a member of this committee, I believe I can talk um, for more than three minutes. And when presented with so many documents, I had to have two panniers today to come in. Um, I, 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 there was a lot in it. And I said, I'll do the long talk at the inquiry. But things like the railway station entrance is the county council. But in terms of paying for it, the developments on Top Farm should and must be providing funding for that type of stuff because they're the only source of income we've got is the money off developers. Uh, and that makes such a difference if we ask early and if the plan says we've got a vague aspiration for an entrance, we can't ask for any money. If the plan says the entrance will cost 25 million, um, that's so much per house, and yeah, we can ask for the money. And this is why I say the plan needs to be firmed out more on these things before we adopt it. I was not suggesting we tear up all the work, but I was suggesting is we put in all the sustainability. I think, I think you'll find the plan does cover all those things. Once again, we are not responsible for the delivery of them. And the Section 106 money is what pays for them. And if we don't build houses, as you propose, we won't have any Section 106 to deliver any of those things. So, you know, you can go around in circles on this all day, but it doesn't make you right. Uh, Councillor Walsh. Yeah, it's just another little question. We mentioned, I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the range of houses being built by the various developers in terms of one, two, three, and four bedrooms, etc. When I was on the planning committee the what, time before last, we, was at the, we had a um, site visit down in Bulkington, the two sites, one off Coventry Road and one off Nuneaton Road. What surprised me when talking to the developers on both sites was the density of build. On the, if I get it, I hope it's right, on the Nuneaton Road site, over the two areas, the two uh, parcels of land, they were talking about building 28 houses per hectare acre. But when we moved on to the Coventry Road site, again, totally different builder, developer, they were looking at building only 22 houses per hectare acre. Now, that's a massive difference in terms of footprint size. Now, obviously, depending on the blend of houses being built, obviously, if one builder is building lots of two-bedroom terrace houses, they can actually pack a lot more on there, obviously. And vice versa, if you're building four- and five-bed houses, you're going to build a lot less. But I didn't know whether, as a borough, we had, or the planning department had any sort of uh, control over that in terms of how densely populated the... Uh, the developers build on their particular sites? Um, in terms of density, we don't have a specific policy which sets out a density per hectare. Um, obviously, there's lots of site constraints, so each site is different, and depending on the quantum of development and also the mix, as you said, each site would be different in terms of densities. Um, we have done a piece of evidence on the densities within the borough, and on average, we're looking at actually around 35 um, dwellings per hectare is, is kind of an average on some of the strategic development sites. So it, it just varies from site to site, depending on what the constraints are and also what the, what the overall capacity for the site is. So based on the type of house being built, i.e. Like one, two, three, four and five bed house, etc., is there a a minimum plot size pro rata based on the size of house being built to give outside, appropriate outside spacing. Obviously, if you're only a one bedroom house, you only need a relatively small garden. If it's a five bedroom house, you'd want a lot larger garden because obviously the green space within for the family, etc. What we main, uh, mainly go by in our borough is one of our SPDs, the Supplementary Planning Document, the Sustainable Design Construction. There are limits in that um, of, say, window, habitable window to habitable window, 
or habitable window to somebody's gable end wall, things like that. And that naturally will work out the layout of a site. Um, and in terms of gardens, we haven't got a standard of how much garden, but what we are saying in this borough plan, and we've learned from COVID, is even the small single bed affordable housing needs some outside space. So that is something that we've actually brought into this borough plan now. Thank you. Councillor Svetlovic. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate the planning policy team on all their hard work and say a big thank you. This kind of document doesn't just write itself. It takes a lot of time and uh, effort to do. And I, I thank you for all your efforts on, on that. Um, I, I have been a, a critic of, of this document in some ways um, regarding the timeline because I do think it has taken too long to produce. I understand what some of the limitations upon you have been. I know waiting for other authorities um, has kind of slowed down the production of this document. So um, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't certainly hold you to account for that because that's, that's beyond your own personal control. Um, and I, I think what we have, and I've said it before at this uh, planning um, borough plan committee meeting, is what we have is a Rolls Royce, something that is finely crafted and has been well put together. And I have argued in the past for a Land Rover, something dependable and reliable, but a lot quicker to put together. Well, we're, we're kind of beyond that stage now. Um, sadly, we've lost a lot of the HSGs. I think the only one we've got left is the Woodlands. And I hope that, you know, that can still be saved um, through, this, do, through this document and the submission to the um, inspectorate. I know all the other sites now have sort of gone uh, and can't be fought. So really, what we're now looking at is, is a, a long-term plan. And uh, again, it's good that we've got this plan here, and it, it, it is so thorough, because one of the problems we had with the old plan was the timeline and, and how long it took to put together. And because the, the, the situation was constantly evolving and adapting, we were always on the back foot with the old borough plan. And, you know, and I do blame our, 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 the previous administration entirely for that. That came under, under their sort of watch and they let that happen. They let the timeline slip. And as they let it slip, developers came forward, you know, and the five year housing land supply went down. All of those things started to happen and we started to fall behind. And, you know, we've got this kind of patchwork borough plan where things were always being thrown in and added even up to the 11th hour, you know, and we lost, we added a lot of sites, you know, like Whitestone, Balkington, et cetera at that point, which, you know, when we accepted 4,000 extra houses of Coventry. So I'm, I'm really pleased that we're sort of actually getting ahead of the game now and that we've actually got something which will take us almost up to 2040, no, it's just, just shy of 2040. Um, and that, that's really good. However, I would like to just ask officers, first of all, before I kind of say the rest of the things I'd like to say, about the memorandum of understanding on this. Um, because on the last memorandum of understanding, you know, we were very much being told what to do by the authorities. And I just want to check now that we're in a stronger position that as we move forward now, the memorandum of understanding, we're in the driving seat because as far as I can see, we're ahead of all the other sort of what boroughs and district councils in terms of producing this plan. So are we then going to be in a, a, a sort of a, a much stronger position where we're not going to have to accept overspill housing and we can control the narrative more so it better suits the needs of our residents? So I don't know if someone can um, answer that. Yeah, I'm happy to come back on, on that. <coughs> The team have progressively worked on the Memorandum of Understanding. They've had regular meetings with our partner authorities. You're right to state none of them, absolutely none of them, are in the same situation we are. We've steamed ahead with our review. We've got it to a really good place. Uh, so the difference between this time and last time is we're leading the pack rather than following them. Uh, there have been some constructive comments, I would say, you'd agree, from our partners. They've helped to shape the Memorandum of Understanding to the point it is at the moment, which is very nearly there. The time now is for us to do the political side, talk to leaders, talk to uh, portfolio holders, and just tick those boxes. The majority of our partners are with us. They 
they actually see what we're doing as a as a brilliant plan. Uh, so so we're not getting the kickback we had before. Even commentary. I was speaking to the portfolio holder at a West Midlands Combined Authority meeting just on Monday, and he didn't really have a bad word to say about our plan where it is now. Um, but we are streets ahead. We're, we've documented all of the conversations and meetings, all of the input from our partners, and it shaped what looks like a fairly decent and wide-reaching uh, plan. It doesn't include 4,000 houses from Coventry, I'm pleased to say. Um, but because everybody else is in a very different place to us, we are giving them the option to revisit the plan, and it's right, we should do that, revisit that memorandum of understanding if their circumstances change. Our plan will already be in place by then, so that's that. But, yeah, so we're in a very different place. I don't know if you've anything to add to that, ladies. No? No, so that's where we are. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm very reassured by, by that. It's, it's really good to hear that um, because I, I think that was a big concern because last time, um, you know, if, if we were part of a dog, you know, um, it was certainly felt like the tail was wagging us. And I don't feel, um, I, I, you know, I stand to be corrected, but at the moment I don't feel that's the case with this plan. I feel that we are now in control of the situation. Um, and, you know, we're sort of much more in terms of creating and crafting our own plan how we want it. Um, and I think that the fact that we're ahead of everyone else, that will in itself hopefully give us security uh, and the same mistakes won't be repeated again, you know, because 10 years to put a plan together is, ju is just ridiculous, you know, because we know what's going to happen. The, the, the situation changes and it all starts to unravel, which is exactly what happened to us. Um, just on some of the other um, things, I mean, just come back on Councillor Condacourt. I was a bit disappointed, Councillor Condacourt, here that uh, you know you, you only keep five to ten percent of the plan and you want the rest rewritten because you said uh, regarding the budget you wanted the budget slashed for for planning yeah you said it you said it i mean it, it's there it's on it's on public record you can shake your head all you like it's on public record so where you know if if you had been in charge would have the money come from um you know and again this thing about putting down the borough, I mean, last night it was stupid, stupid this, stupid that. Even today on social media, I can see, you know, stupid. And by the way, you need to check your grammar because your grammar's all wrong. Uh, I thought you'd like to know that after the comments that were made last night. Um, and then, you know, talking down the borough today, it, it's just not acceptable. Yeah, I know you have your vision of what you would like. You know, you've got your own sort of utopian version of what the borough should like. But this borough doesn't just con concern you and your wife and a few of your kind of stragglers. You know, we've got, you know, 150, 160,000 people here that we need to consider. And, you know, there is a variety of need. And we cannot just keep so coming back around the same issues of sewerage and um, cycle paths. We cannot just keep going around. So there, is, there is more to this than those issues. And I, I'd, I'd ask you to really embrace those issues as well, okay? Because it's, it's, we can't devolve it this and boil this down to just two or three things. Yeah, we've got to look, look at it holistically as to where we are. And I, I feel at the moment you're getting to the minutia of a few areas that you have a personal interest in. I know we all have our personal interest, but sometimes we've got to get our head up and we've got to try and look at the bigger picture that's here in terms of what's good and what's right for the borough. And you know, I would urge you to try and, and, and do that. And I know it's difficult. I'm in a similar position myself when it comes to some of this, because as you know, I've been involved in trying to oppose a lot of this for many years now as well. Maybe not quite as long as yourself, but at least the five or six years. And I have to do that because that's what I'm here to do as a councillor. That's what I'm here to do as a committee member. And I think, you know, let's not sell this plan short. You know, there's a heck of a lot in here, but it's very, very positive. You know, and will take us, you know, to where we need to be, um, and to be more secure by, you know, the time it's um, it, it starts to come and bear fruition. Okay, so I just thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak on the matter. Sharing some of your problems, Councillor Walsh. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, yeah, um, I have to agree with a, a lot of what's been said about the team. I've obviously been on this journey with them, and it has been a bit of a journey. 
They have pulled out all the stops. They have worked just above and beyond what's been called for them to deliver this this quickly. And I just wanted to go through a few takeouts from it. We can talk about the minutiae of it, but if you look at this plan, it delivers less housing than we currently have. We're currently, with the shortfall of build over the pandemic, etc., we need a thousand houses a, an annum building now. Uh, and the new plan nearly halves that to 545. So that is a considerable drop in the annual delivery of homes. It protects our green belt. There is absolutely no fresh green belt in this plan. Economic diversification. The revised plan gives us 80 hectares of employment land to create jobs and uh, boost our local economy. Town centre regeneration. The revised plan supports all our ambitions for regeneration in both of our towns. Improvements to infrastructure and facilities. I know people will argue about that all day long, but the plan does outline the needs. And it will be Im improved and funded by Section 106 because we are building the right amount of houses. Increased open space and leisure access. We incorporate the new playing pitch and parks and open spaces strategy that our, our partners in parks and open spaces have pulled together. It addresses climate change. I know uh, Councillor Condacore will disagree, but there is a thread runs right the way through this plan that addresses some of the needs of climate change. And for me, the, the uh, gypsy and traveller accommodation situation is, is outstanding. We've reduced the unmet need from, I think, I can't remember, 30-something? It was over 30 sites, and traditionally that has caused us a lot of pain and anguish because it leaves us open to uh, inappropriate sites, usually in the green belt, uh, that circumvent most of the planning rules because they are gypsy and traveller sites. And because we have no unmet need, now we will put them where they should be, and, uh, and that's quite right. We do need to provide those sites, but they should be at our will, not at the will of people who want them, put them wherever they can. So there's a lot of plus points in this plan. has been delivered fairly astoundingly quickly compared with the last one. Uh, if there's no other speakers, you've... Oh, Council Condico. <coughs> Chair, you mentioned the Memorandum of Understanding and what went wrong with the Labour plan many years ago was that was discussed going around at this thing called the Joint Committee or something, and no one had any side to it, and then Dennis Harvey signed up to it uh, in a dreadfully undemocratic way. Um, can you reassure us that as it gets near to being um, agreed, there will be a citing of it by this committee or a similar committee? Um, and secondly, while we're having these negotiations with Coventry, can we please try and progress things like the Bay Platform, which will make things more sustainable? It originally was about 13 million, then it went to 20 million, and I think they got 20 million, then it's going to be 25. And it, it's these sort of things that the joint committees and need to get right, so we're not dumping more traffic on the A Triple Four. So, can I have your assurances on that? Those sort of things, which you only see because you get to these uh, combined authority type meetings. Ah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Council Condico. Um, it's one thing we can agree on. We have led on this. We have involved all of our partners. And we're nearly at a point now where we can send out letters to all the leaders and portfolio holders with agreement of their officers ready for signing. At that point, yes, I'll be happy to share where we are with it. We're not quite there yet, but we are nearly there. So at the next Borough Plan meeting, I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure there'll be something we can share on that so you can have a view on it before it's signed at the end of the year. 
Um, yes. Um, just very quickly before we start wrapping up the meeting, Chairman, just uh, wanted to propose a vote of thanks from the committee to the entire team who's had a part in developing this document for, for all their outstanding work. Thank you. Yes, I'll be happy to include that. Do, do we have a seconder? Yes. All in favour? Yes. Can we make sure that's documented in the minutes, please? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty much there now. We have uh, no more members wanting debate. Uh, we have the recommendations. Um, they are quite long, so I'm not going to go through them all again. Um, but they are as printed. So, uh, they're... Recommendations. So if you look in your agenda papers, they're on page 12. So if everybody's happy there, we'll proceed to the vote. All those in favour? Against? I'll record your vote, certainly. Okay. Uh, that concludes the business of the, this committee. There's, there are no other items I'm aware of. Uh, so if we can stop the recording, please. And thank you all for your attendance. <laughs>